So we all love live action remakes, right guys? We're not sick of them at all. And when Netflix does a live action adaptation of a beloved anime, well, that's even better, right? Oh. Now, I'm a fan of Bebop, so when the live action reinterpretation dropped, I was right there, and then couldn't even finish the damn thing because it felt like such a false cash-in on what must be the greatest anime ever aired. And now, Netflix have dropped a live-action reimagining of arguably the most popular anime ever right now, and that is One Piece. But here's the thing about the new One Piece. I've never watched any of the anime, never read any of the manga, I'm sorry. It's just kind of a lot to try and tackle. It's over a thousand episodes of something, and that's not even counting how many issues of the manga there are. But it puts me in an interesting position. I'm sure One Piece's fan base have a lot of thoughts about the new show. I've seen both positive and viciously negative reactions all over social media, and both are rooted in their love and knowledge of the anime. So what if you take an idiot who's never watched a frame of One Piece before and put all eight episodes of the live-action remake in front of him? Well, after having gotten through this first season, I gotta say, I'm definitely feeling like... The One Piece! The One Piece is real! Oh hey, thanks Patrick Fabian. Yeah, what he said. Watching the pirates folly in total blindness to the anime without any of the expectations or desires of a fan just as a season of television it ruled. I was invested in the characters, in the melodrama, in the ridiculous spectacle, and while I consider myself a big anime novice, this felt like a live-action anime adaptation that finally managed to capture the vibe of anime. I loved Netflix's One Piece. I mean, they literally grabbed me from the Ian McShane voiceover intro. Now, just for context, the story of One Piece begins with the death of Gold Roger, the Pirate King, whose hoard of treasure, the One Piece, he managed to hide away beforehand, and the plot revolves around this simultaneous hunt for the treasure, but also the scramble over the power vacuum that Gold Roger's absence causes. And from that, we meet Luffy. Monkey D. Luffy, a kid with a dream of becoming the king of the pirates, who lacks the means to do so. I was so endeared to Luffy right away. I mean, from the first moment I saw him on screen, which was the first hint that this show was going to make me care about these characters. Yeah, I usually get annoyed with the yuppie, overly positive, infallible protagonist that we see in a lot of anime series, but in this case, I think the series did a good job of showing Luffy as a person in his good-heartedness while also adding texture and showing us how he got there, showing us that he wasn't always this way. The flashbacks and backstory really do a lot of the heavy lifting in making Luffy feel like a real person who's just, you know, maybe a bit too naive, a bit too... Yeah, he's your classic anime protagonist. But he's also our focal point in this season and throughout the entire show. And as much else the show has to offer, which we'll get into, I think it lives or dies on how invested you are in Luffy succeeding. And I'm invested. He was an orphaned street kid without a family looking for a new one, and he found it in being a pirate. I love how he just sort of finds his way in the middle of the various skirmishes that happen early on, scrapping his way in baby steps towards his dream. He keeps true to the spirit of Gold Roger's original intent for the hunt for the One Piece, an important parallel that comes into play later on when he confronts his grandfather, and his grandfather is forced to reconcile with the fact that, uh, you know, Luffy has something special. He has the same thing that possessed Gold Roger and caused Gold Roger to be the inspiration that he was, as opposed to everyone else who's lost sight in all of that, indulging in ego and villainy. The show is, in part, about dreams and following them in spite of what the system tells you of the path it might insist you take, and Luffy repeatedly awakens that in the other characters. It really takes hold of that pirate spirit of manifest destiny and being in control of your own fate for better or worse and puts it at the forefront. All of our antagonists are people who've been slighted throughout their lives, whether it's 
are long or buggy and they use that as a crutch. They do a bit of role reversal and still uphold the system in place, but now they're in a position of power, and so they beat down on the people that have beaten down on them for so long, and it really doesn't amount to much good. Whereas Luffy and his crew of Straw Hat Pirates believe in something more, believe that they can change the system from within and revamp images by pursuing these pure good-hearted dreams. Not every pirate is like Buggy or the Black Cat Captain or Arlong. There are good pirates out there who believe in helping others. Luffy sees piracy as a freedom as opposed to, say, Kobe at the beginning, who doesn't want to be a pirate and talks to Luffy early on more as if it's a kind of indentured servitude, a means to an end, if even that. And what's so great about that interaction is that that's Kobe's worldview, that's his experience, because it's all he's ever known working under Captain Alveda. He sees the Marines as this infallible moral compass, and it's what makes Kobe's arc so interesting, is when he gets enlisted into the Marines, and then is forced to reconcile with the reality that the Marines aren't really as good-natured as you would think. Similar to the pirates, they've strayed away from the purity of their original formation, the spirit of what they were about. And so just as Luffy tries to revamp the image of pirates show that they don't have to be these fear warmongering monsters, Kobe does the same once he's enlisted in the Marines and tries to make changes, and so the Marines return to the core idea of helping people in need. And this first interaction between those two characters is a perfect early nod to the pure ideas being perverted by human agendas, greed, and ego, and it's important to the larger thesis of the show. Luffy is perhaps a bit too naive in his worldview because of his own experiences with good-natured pirates such as Shanks, while Captain Alveda represents a more realistic take on the ruthlessness of pirates and how that has sort of informed Kobe's worldview. And the entire show will be this exploration of that tug and pull between the negative connotation associated with the name pirate and how Luffy seeks to change it. The show focuses on being a pirate as a life of unpredictability, but also adventure and freedom. There are bad pirates, and we are introduced to many of them throughout this show, but there are also those that cling to the spirit of the rebellious act of being a pirate, of the individualism, of sticking it to the system and status quo, and basking in the feeling of that without giving way to malice. And from the jump, I love how the show captures that feeling through its larger-than-life tone, the chaotic pacing, the exaggerated characters. That's something, obviously, really present in anime that is so easily lost or misinterpreted when transitioning into live action, as we've seen before. Animation is limitless, which kind of goes hand in hand with the spirit of being a pirate in the show, whereas live action is limited by some form of reality, heightened as it may be. But One Piece found a way to construct a heightened reality that fits naturally with the age of pirates, yet still feels pacey and kinetic in the particular way that only anime can. This thing is just so much fun. And you know, keeping true to the spirit of the show, this One Piece adaptation proves that just because live action reimaginings of animes have largely failed, doesn't mean that they all have to. One Piece dares to be different, dares to do things differently, and it succeeds as a result, and I think has encouraged people that, yes, you can adapt anime for live action, you just have to go about it the right way. I mean, this show has tons of swashbuckling action and adventure, and it's truly a spiritual successor to Pirates of the Caribbean, only even more unhinged and after it's done a couple of lines. It doesn't just feel like live action cosplay that has plagued so many previous live action anime adaptations. They do a great job of developing these characters, helping us understand why they're drawn together, tackling insecurity, toxic masculinity, and conformity through the lens of pirates. It also helps that so much of this show is 
practical. The sets are stunning. The costumes are incredibly detailed. This feels like a fully realized world and it feels tangible at that too, which is something that we don't really get a whole lot of in high budget television shows like this. I love the recurring theme from early on in the story about the obsession with rankings and status, about insecurity regarding how the world views you, and also wanting to be seen and known for something, whatever that something will be. It makes the stylized wanted posters that accompany the various bounties, as cool and memorable as it is, how they weave it into the on-screen action, more resonant than just being an introduction to the character. It says, here, have your glory, have your infamy, and a price on your head with it. And that ties into the masculinity commentary as well. The need to have power and fame can simultaneously be indicative of how a lot of young people, young boys, view masculinity and the senseless need to peacock and retaliate just to prove their strength. Even the hunt for the One Piece itself basically becomes this face-off about who can flex their strength and piracy skills more. People have forgotten the purpose of the quest, and the whole thing becomes this impossible myth. And now that Luffy has reignited an interest in the One Piece, everyone wants to take his dream from him for the sake of their own ego, because if Luffy has a choice and Luffy can accomplish these great things, then that means that they had a choice all along and it would prove their worldview is wrong and incredibly flawed. A lot of the villains Luffy and his Straw Hat crew come into contact with, whether it was Axe Hand Morgan with an axe for a hand or Buggy with his deformed nose, lack confidence in themselves and try to construct an image that bolsters their ego from a foundation of fear. And a lot of the show is challenging people and their worldviews. Just because something happens to you that causes scars doesn't mean it has to absolutely define you for the rest of time. I see One Piece as really being about accepting all different kinds of people and learning to see beyond your narrow view of things. I particularly like the dynamic between Buggy and Luffy in episode 2 because of this. It shows Luffy an antagonistic reflection of himself. This is who he once was as a kid, and who he could become if he plays into the pity party of his otherness, if he tries to uphold the flawed, egotistical, selfish image of being a pirate. By embracing your otherness, by coming to terms with what's been and trying to improve yourself, people will start to embrace you. Luffy remarks at one point that you can't make people love you just like you can't make them smile, as Buggy has literally held an entire town captive and in chains as a forced audience. You can't make people fear you when they see you for who you are. This show isn't just about Luffy though. The other main characters rule too. Take Nami. Again, I live under a rock when it comes to the anime, but I've seen a fair bit of stuff online about how unpopular she is, I guess. I don't know if her initial self-servedness is on par for how she acts in the anime, but here it evolves into something much more selfless and it makes the character far richer than I think any of us expected. Early on, she remarks about how Money really shows you who people truly are. Most people only care about themselves and what's theirs. And Zoro, spoiler alert, the best character in the entire show, calls her out when he remarks that Sounds like someone I know. Nami doesn't seem to believe in others at first, believes that the only thing worth living for is cash and self-preservation. But underneath the surface, it's not so simple as her just wanting to be rich, people be damned. We learned that Nami has sacrificed or lost damn near everything that actually mattered to her, and her selfishness is little more than a protective armor she wears. She pushes away people who try to care about her out of guilt about what happened to her mother in particular. She has this disdain for people in positions of privilege, the elite, the wealthy, because of how she grew up. She grew up in this little village that was raided and taken over by pirates and resulted in the death of her mother and she was forced to serve Arlong and his pirate gang as a means to help save her village. Her mother taught her that she has to make tough decisions, sacrifices for other people and so she literally sacrificed a big chunk of her life in order to earn enough money to free her village and she played it so close to the chest because she didn't want anyone else to suffer 
But that's what friends are for. Friends are there to lighten the load, to be there, to boost you up, and to help you along your journey. And that's something that Nami has to understand. She doesn't need to push people away. These people care about her and want to be a part of her life. And because of that, they are willing to do whatever they have to in order to help her along her way, in order to get her out of these predicaments. And that's just beautiful. There's an interesting dynamic between Nami and Zoro. Zoro's definitely a bit similar, equally stoic, equally a bit hesitant to open up and become a part of this crew, but he's also collected collecting bounties off of pirates for money, but as we see later on, he harbors a dissatisfaction with his current lifestyle. He's realizing that there might be more to life and that he doesn't have to be this way, just like Nami doesn't have to be a thief working for Arlong. That circles back to the idea of challenging beliefs. Nami is constantly challenged and proved wrong about how the world is. Piece by piece, Nami's distrust is chipped away until she realizes that the point is trust people, give each person a chance until they give you a reason not to. It takes her till the penultimate episode to finally accept this, when Luffy arrives to help save her from self-sabotaging. She needs help to save her village and is finally willing to ask for it and Luffy in turn offers her his straw hat and the crew, her friends, to help her on her way. This is her fight, but they will be there as her crew this time, as her friends. It's a great payoff to arguably the most emotional arc throughout the entire season. Zoro gets there a lot sooner than Nami does. I really love his little extended flashback in the fourth episode. He loses someone very important to him, someone who shared his dreams of becoming the world's greatest swordsman to ever live. Someone who pushed him the same way he pushed her, and he has to reconcile with the promise they made to each other to become the best and keep fighting every day, even when it seems futile or impossible. He carries her sword with him as a reminder of his loyalty and faith in the people he cares about, and he eventually comes to feel that way about Luffy. That was the point that cemented him as my favorite character. It ultimately comes down to why the Straw Hat crew is effective and different. It isn't ultimately about raiding villages, getting as much gold as possible, or perfect plans for any of them, including Zoro. It's about adventure and freedom. That's the whole ethos of the show, even if it's a paradox. Being a pirate puts a bounty on your head, yet it's also the thing that makes you feel the most free. It's also that spirit that makes this crew feel like a family, whereas all the other ship crews we meet feel like just that, a chain of command that works like a well-oiled machine, but is destined to fail due to the selfishness of their captain. Ultimately, it lacks heart. That's why after Zoro loses his fight against the warlord Mihawk at the end of the fifth episode, when we then spend episode six watching him cling to life, it doesn't feel like the show grinding to a halt just because there's less action. It's everything the show had been building to thematically, coming together as a cohesive whole. Luffy is forced to come to terms with the reality of being a pirate and what makes a good captain. And Zoro spends this time caught in limbo between life and death. It's up to his friends to find a way to keep him tethered to their world, to talk to him, tell him stories, to let them know they care and that they're still with him. They haven't abandoned him. Losing the duel is okay. Losing in life is okay. And they haven't lost faith in him. It's genuinely beautiful stuff, and it's what reignites Zoro's passion. Luffy refused to stand in the way of him pursuing his dream because he knows firsthand what that means to someone because of how it affects him. And yeah, it could have meant Zoro losing his life, but I mean, what's the point of living if you're forced to adhere to the box society has put you in? Luffy understands that, and is part of the reason why Zoro reignites his promise to be the best swordsman, but this time he makes that promise to Luffy. 
And my god, this isn't even mentioning Sanji and the struggles with feeling creatively stifled, with the feeling that he's just running his talents through the motions, the parallels between Luffy and his relationship with his grandfather, and Sanji and his relationship with Zeph, his father figure, in the kitchen, or the story of how Sanji and Zeph were marooned during a storm for three months, and how that shaped who both of them are. Or Usopp, another outcast who Luffy strikes up a friendship with, so as to get the perfect ship and crew, his whole backstory of showing up to tell tales of his false adventures to his affluent but ailing friend Kaya, even as the rest of the town view him as poorer and inferior, a liar, someone who's just driven them about as far away from him as they can because of his inferiority complex. He feels he has to live up to the legacy of his father, who was a pirate, and yet he's never experienced life the way that his father has, because he's afraid of losing the people he cares about, of losing Kaya just like he lost his mother. He stopped following his dreams and living for himself, and has fallen back on stories, lies, not only to help Kaya cope with her illness, but to help him cope with the fact that he's not actually doing these things. He wants to present this image of being a strong, sure-handed captain, someone who's very accomplished, someone who is worthy of his father's name, but he has to get there for himself. He can't just, you know, make these things up. And all of the flashbacks and obstacles our characters have to overcome are always beautifully reflected in the villains. Arlong, for example, the biggest threat to the crew is xenophobic to humans in response to how humans have treated his people, the Fishmen, who are yet another group seen as outcasts, as the others, and that's turned Arlong into someone bitter and rageful, a radical, creating an image that aligns with what humans view him as, because what's the point? They deserve to suffer as he has. He gives in to being a monster because of his trauma. He's vindictive and wants everyone to feel as powerless as he once did. But don't let the emphasis on character depth imply that when the show does kick back into its high octane action gear, the results aren't incredible. I mean, even in the same episode that ponders over a comatose Zoro, there's still an incredible fight sequence with Arlong that is just so big and ridiculous and yet it somehow works. Luffy's gum gum attacks seem on paper like something way too outlandish even for an anime live action adaptation, and yet, when you see it play out here, in live action, there's an element of it being hilariously ridiculous and yet kinda cool. As much as I wish some of this looked a little more premium, it generally has the VFX and choreography quality I expect from Netflix, I mean, maybe a little bit better in the choreography department. There's also a kineticism to this that I feel is absent from, say, current Star Wars on TV or the MCU, even if more of those properties put their budgets up on the screen than One Piece does. But nothing rivals the Straw Hats versus Fishmen fight in the finale. I can't believe they made something like that work in live action. It's unreal how embracing the absurdity and cheesiness managed to be so endearing. But it worked! I mean, this thing genuinely has to be seen to be believed. And of course our heroes win at the end, but why wouldn't they after everything that's happened? This is a story about the old guard learning to make way for the next generation and build a better world, eradicating old think and handing over the reins. This is the lesson Vice Admiral Garp and Zeph have to reconcile with. It's scary to take your hands off the control, but you have to trust in the next generation's ability to take over and take control of their own destiny the way they see fit, follow their dreams just as the old guard had. It's time for the next generation to learn and be the best versions of themselves as possible. The old guard had their time, and they did what they could to make the world better. Maybe they mucked it up a bit more than they were hoping, but it's time to let young blood take over and reignite a passion for these pure ideas. And it was inevitable that the Straw Hat crew would accomplish that. The finale kind of mellows out at the end. There's a bit of a multiple ending thing going on for all the characters, but honestly, it works. It genuinely felt like an anime ending in the best way possible after that big battle. Sweeping emotions, melodrama, teeing up next season, adventure, and if a Lord of the Rings-esque epilogue is the price to pay for it, I think that's more than a fair trade. Okay, look, 
there are some moments where it perhaps is evoking anime a bit too literally. But I do think there is some sort of perfection in the insanity. It's about as damn near perfect of an anime adaptation you're going to get in live action. And yeah, you can envision how certain moments would work in 2D, but in live action it becomes a bit much and in a few cases robs the emotional moments of full impact. The child action in the flashbacks is a bit hit or miss and some of the motivations outside of the main crew are a bit ambiguous. For example, I can't quite pinpoint whether Garp is a good or bad guy, even though he's arguably the biggest antagonist of the season outside of Arlong. When the Vice Admiral says he was doing all of this to test Luffy, did he mean the entire time he was chasing him? Or that final fight between the two after he's kind of come to realize how Luffy is confident in himself, how he's the only one who knows who he is and what his goals and ambitions are. It's a bit nebulous, but maybe that's the point. I mean, I love how gray a lot of these characters are, how they come off one way, and then a couple episodes later, you'll see them in a new light. And maybe Garp and his marines are trying to reach the same level of enlightenment as the Straw Hat crew have, and that they aren't bad guys, they just need more time. A big reason why One Piece works, though, is that yes, it has all the anime iconography, the ridiculous costumes, looks, hair, sets, and action, but that's not all it has to offer, and that's not even really the most important thing. There are genuinely compelling character moments. In fact, most of the show is spent on exploring these characters and their baggage, and especially for the main cast, how being a part of the Straw Hat crew helps them unpack that and helps them figure out what their purpose and dream is. It's really effective, and it says something that I never felt like I missed the action or the spectacle. I was happy to just sit with these people for a bit. That's another avenue I think a lot of anime adaptations go wrong. They place so much emphasis on the action and the insanity of it that they lose that intimacy of the characters and why it's so effective in the anime. One Piece manages to endear you to the characters and their struggles, paralleling the villains of each arc with the hero they choose to focus on. It features a really skillfully weaved in use of flashbacks. I love how complex everyone is. They could have easily painted these characters in broad strokes, but everyone had layers and an angle of sympathy. Even the people you think you hate are sympathetic to a point. Look, if you're already a One Piece fan, you might have much bigger qualms than I do. Maybe this show is some sort of betrayal of its source material, but I highly doubt that given the fact that the creator was very heavily involved and it feels like he was able to streamline a lot of the ideas he had in the anime and manga in a way that feels more natural and allows these characters to feel more three-dimensional. I don't know. I couldn't tell you either way. What I can tell you is that overall, this was an incredibly impressive first season. It was remarkably confident, stylish, and unabashedly fun, which is what I want out of a pirate story. So you know what? Patrick Fabian was right. The One Piece is real!